Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this lovely spring morning. Sorry about that, Chris. Um, I'm, I'm sure the experts amongst you are telling me it's not actually officially spring yet. We've still got another month to wait for that, but it feels like spring, so let's be thankful for that. Big thank you to Andrew for organising all the techniques uh, this morning, without which none of this would be possible. Thank you, Andrew. And Sharon, it's great to have you leading our service again this morning. God bless you and your word to us this morning. Well, it's absolutely lovely to be back with you all today and um, not just sneaking in to watch part of the service on Zoom. So today is the first Sunday in Lent and it's traditional on this Sunday to think about temptation and some of our thinking will be around that, although more about being tested. But our opening prayer has been adapted from Psalm 25, verses 4 to 5, which is this particular one is from the Passion Version. Lord, direct us throughout our journeys so we can experience your plan for our lives. Reveal the life paths that are pleasing to you. Escort us along the way. Take each of us by the hand and teach us. For you are the God of our increasing salvation. We have wrapped our hearts into yours. Amen. And we're going to have our first hymn, which is, um, I can't actually see, isn't that terrible? Here we go. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. And so we come to our prayer of adoration and the images that are going to appear during the different prayers are courtesy of Kath Phillips. She's been out to the Holy Land and these are photos that she shared with us. Let us pray. Lord, we have come to worship you, to praise and adore you. At this time of Lent, we think about you fasting in the desert resisting temptation and turning away Satan through your faithfulness to your Father. Help us be strong, turning our backs on the things that tempt us. Keep us from wrong. Give us the grace to follow in your footsteps over these next weeks. Help us to find more time for you, time to talk, time to listen to you time just to be with you. Keep us focused on you as you focused on your Father, on your mission, and finally, on your cross. 
Jesus, you gave everything for us. What can we give you in return but our love, our lives, and our souls? Amen. And now we're going to have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now we're going to have our reading. Thank you. The reading is from Mark chapter 1, reading verses 9 to 15. The Baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to, to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Alison. We've got a reflection now for the first Sunday in Lent. And at the end of that, we're going to be singing a hymn that is an oldie. I like to think of them as oldies, but goldies. But I'll come to that in a moment. So this prayer, this reflection. Tempter in my wilderness, get thee behind me. You who stalk my quiet moments, diverting my mind from thoughts of God, you have no place in my heart. You who waylay my good intentions, messing with my priorities and turning me away from paths of righteousness, get out of my way. You who undermine my self-esteem, who speak doubts into my head at night, robbing me of sleep. I cast you out. You who use my weaknesses against me, tripping me up with my pride, blinding my compassion by my busyness. Know that you will never be stronger than the one who defends me. For I have a God who is greater than you, I am loved by a God whose patience stretches further than my restless thoughts. I have a good shepherd who will fetch me back to the right path. I trust in a God who knows me through and through and loves me still. I rest myself in the arms of a God of peace. I am restored by a savior who can turn everything to good for those who love him. There is no room in my life for you, tempter in the wilderness, for my soul belongs to God above, the God of heaven and the Lord of lords. Oh God, my creator, forgive my deliberate wrongdoings and my unintentional faults, my acts of selfishness, and my lack of loving kindness. Jesus Christ, my savior, set me free from the cords of sin that would bind me and keep me from temptation snare. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Be my strong armor, my sword of truth and my shield against temptation. 
deliver me from the evil one. For yours alone is the kingdom, the power and the glory from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. And now we come to the hymn that I was telling you about. It's Tell Me the Story of Jesus. It's not perhaps the one you're immediately thinking of. It's a different one by Fanny Crosby. Thanks, Andrew. Sounded a bit, didn't it? Like we were listening to the um, an old record, but when I went looking for the different versions that there might be of that old hymn, um, there there was one that left out completely the verse about fasting in the desert, which was kind of important to today, and one or two others that just didn't have the images. So 
I hope you enjoyed the fact that you felt like you stepped back in time. And to balance it, at the end of the service, we've got a modern hymn. So, like I said at the beginning, it's traditional on the first Sunday in Lent to think about temptation. And indeed, often throughout Lent, we observe a period of abstinence over something, whether that be cake, biscuits, chocolate, alcohol, or sometimes these days, social media. We do it because in some small way, we want to share in what Jesus went through during his period, trial and temptation. Sometimes we manage it quite well, other times not so good. And I'm reminded of a story I heard about a Christian man who decided that during Lent, he would give up cakes and biscuits and chocolate. He had rather too much of a liking for such things. So he looked on the time of Lent as an opportunity to lose some pounds and gain some self-discipline. He took it very seriously, even changing the route he drove to work to avoid his favorite bakery so that he wouldn't be unnecessarily tempted. One morning, however, he arrived at his office carrying a gigantic chocolate cake. His friends teased him for having no willpower, but he replied, aha, but this is a very special chocolate cake. I accidentally drove past the bakery this morning and there in the window were a host of goodies. I felt that this could not be without meaning for me. So I prayed, Lord, if you want me to break my Lenten fast and have one of those delicious chocolate cakes, let me find a parking space right in front of the bakery. And sure enough, he continued, the eighth time around the block, there it was. We've all been there, haven't we? Maybe not with chocolate cake, but with giving in to temptation. But you know, whilst there may certainly be merit in giving something up for Lent, what we heard about in our reading this morning goes so much deeper than that. It's something that when we get to the heart of it, really affects our faith and how we live it. It changes how we look at adversity. It helps us to grow spiritually. Mark gives a very succinct telling of Jesus being tested in the wilderness. We're used to the greater detail that we hear in Matthew and Luke's gospels. But, you know, there is something to be said for the brevity of Mark. In fact, he only takes the centre few verses of a bigger story, which begins with being Jesus being baptised and hearing those affirming words from his father. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And then the same spirit who had descended on him like a dove empowering and blessing him, drives him out into the wilderness. Forty days later, Jesus reappears and begins his ministry with the words, the time has come. What happened during those 40 days was a necessary, though brutal, testing. Mark, however, doesn't dwell on it, because for him its importance is less about the ordeal that Jesus faced and more about how it readied Jesus for all that was to come. There would be many times when he could have been turned off focus in his ministry or lost focus. Turn stones into bread to appease his hunger? No, because the same Jesus who multiplied loaves and fishes to feed a crowd of thousands knew that the people needed something more to satisfy their soul's yearning and became for them and for us the bread of life. Have all the nations fall at his feet? No, for the same Jesus who rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday did so on a humble donkey, eschewing the trappings of earthly fame and glory. 
throw himself off a high place to demonstrate that he truly was God's chosen one. No, this same Jesus would choose to hang on a cross for love of humanity. The hordes of angels who with one word could have come to his aid would hold back because that word would never be spoken by the one who had already defeated Satan. In life, we all face trials and temptations. Times when we feel lost or in a wilderness. We even talk about wilderness experiences. And interestingly, we often experience them just after a period when life seemed rosy, when we were on a bit of a high. Or perhaps it's just that the contrast is all the more marked when we're suddenly brought down to earth by circumstance. Though we seldom welcome them, it is those times which strengthen us. It is those times which help mold us and make us who we are. For many people, this last year has been something of a wilderness time, or at least it has had times within it when we've been tested, perhaps for some, to the limit of their endurance. It has for all of us been a trial in some way. It may be that we have been tempted to despair or tempted to give up on God altogether. It's all too much, we say, or we don't have any answers as to why things have happened the way they have. Remember though, that what Satan might intend for our destruction, God will use for our good. When Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthians, he assures them that no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. And that word for testing is also translated temptation. So one of those lines could read, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So what is our way out when we are tested or tempted? How do we cope? Because such times have come before and will surely come again. Even Jesus, though he turned away Satan in the wilderness, had to resist him again in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, I would say that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, on our hope, in him that never fails, not to let ourselves be discouraged, but to stay rooted in Christ. And to do that, we need four things. One, scripture. Read your Bible over and over again and again. It is those words that we know off by heart that will spring to our minds and to our aid when we most need them. Secondly, prayer. It is our lifeline to God. Without it, we are so much weaker and less able to stand firm in times of trial. Scripture and prayer are like armor, and we need to gird ourselves with them. Thirdly, fellowship. Talk with other Christians, listen to them, and encourage one another. The love we share in Christ will help them and us in ways we could never have imagined. Sometimes it's what keeps us going when nothing else can. And four, action. Do whatever we can to help others. In our present times, it might feel like there's not a lot we can do, but it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. There's an acronym, ARC. Acts of random kindness. Even one simple act each day makes a difference to the person we're helping and to us. So 
I invite you, here and now, let us pledge to take up the challenge. Scripture, prayer, fellowship, action. That during this time of Lent, we may grow deeper in Christ, so that come trial or temptation or times of testing, we may not fail, but stay strong in our faith to the glory of God. Amen. Now I invite Dorothy to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Loving Lord, once more <clears throat> we are gathered to worship and praise you. Now is our time to come to you in prayer, asking on behalf of others and ourselves. So many people all over the world are suffering, caused by many different problems. Famine, displacement, flood, war, disease, and the pandemic. We pray for all in their time of need. You alone know what is needed, and we ask you to be with all in these difficult times. We're so grateful as a country to be in this country where nearly all of us have certainly been offered the chance of a vaccine to make our lives safer. And we thank you that the richer countries are coming together and pledging support to the poorer countries so that they too may benefit from this chance. As to you and to us, all lives are precious and matter. We ask your guidance for all the leaders of countries where big decisions need to be made. We await the news to let us know how we can ease back into a more normal life again safely and ask that although we are impatient, that caution and care is taken. We ask you to be with all the families who are struggling as they attempt to work and educate the children to the best of their ability. For some with all the modern technology, the chore has been easier than others. But we thank you <clears throat> for the initiatives of donating older equipment and it being made available to those who need it. For the families and anyone else who are struggling financially, which can lead to all sorts of abuse. We ask that people are vigilant and if they're concerned, their cries are heard. <clears throat> we ask for your protection on all frontline workers, the ones faced daily with contact with disease and infection. Keep them all protected correctly and safely when they do their work and not abused and attacked, which sadly has happened. For all of us here, either sharing today on Zoom, reading the transcript online or written, each with their own worries and concerns. We especially today think of Andrew Avery and his family on the death of his mother-in-law so soon after his grandmother. We think of all who grieve the loss of a loved family member or friend and pray that you will comfort and strengthen them in their time of need. As we walk through this wilderness time, let us look outward at the signs of new life in our gardens and as we walk. The flowers starting to bloom, bringing colour once more. Help us to be heartened by that, that all things shall come to pass with you and your love holding us close. Tomorrow, will be a good day. Amen. And now let us join together singing the hymn Before the Throne of God Above.
So we come to our blessing. This is taken from Prayers for All Seasons by Nick Fawcett. And if you would respond to the words that are capitalized and in bold, that would be lovely. May we take with us the desert, the bread, the stones, the water. The desert to walk with Jesus, the bread to feed the poor, the stones to keep us earthed. The water to quench our thirst for justice. So may we be the angels who wait on our desert world, bringing the love of the kingdom to others. Amen. <laughs>